Hi, I'm John Byrne with Poets and Fonts. Welcome to the MBA Summit. This is our third and final panel of the morning. Uh, this time we have three excellent companies uh, represented by, uh, really, all Ross alums. And um, we'll hear from Google, Amazon, and McKinsey, three of the most desirable MBA employers on the planet. And then as a special treat, we have the incredibly dynamic and charismatic Dean from Michigan Ross, Scott DeRue. My mic. Can you believe it? <laughs> Unbelievable. Sorry about that, folks. I forgot to turn on my mic. So uh, let me repeat what I had said to those outside this room. Uh, this is our panel of three uh, major corporations that actively employ MBAs and they are among the most desirable employers on the planet for the MBA graduate, uh, Google, Amazon, and McKinsey. And we have as a special treat the charismatic and dynamic dean from Michigan Ross, Scott DeRue. Thanks, John. So welcome, everybody. Uh, let me introduce our three corporate representatives, uh, Peter uh, Farsi from Amazon Marketplace, uh, Peter is a 1995 graduate of Ross, who is VP of Amazon Marketplace. Welcome. Thank you. We have Ellis Griffin uh, to his immediate left, who graduated from Ross in 1999. Bet you the campus has changed a little bit since you were here, right? A little bit. And Ellis is Global Head of Inclusion and Diversity at McKinsey and works in the Atlanta office. Uh, and last but hardly least, we have Mr. Moonshot. <laughs> so, uh, Grant Darcy graduated from Ross uh, not that long ago, uh, half dozen years, uh, in 2012, and he is the head of strategy at X, the moonshot factory at Google. Glad to be here. Such an exciting uh, title. I love that. Shrouded moonshot in factory. <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get to that uh, during our panel. So. Let, let's, let's start at, at, at the basic level. Like, what does your company value most about an MBA? Let's start with me? Let's go for you. All right. Well, uh, first of all, uh, it's so great that you guys put this forum together. I think it's fantastic. I, probably for all of us, we wish when we were thinking about getting an MBA, we would have had a resource like this. So this is really awesome. Thank you for inviting us and putting this together. Um, at, at Amazon, uh, I think what we've learned over time is that we're not idea constrained and we're not capital resource constrained. We're really uh, people constrained. You know, we're leader constrained. And so, in particular, uh, we love to hire uh, really talented MBAs because we want people to come in and take really big roles and have a chance to, to launch something or, or take on a big product responsibility uh, within our company. And so, I think it's almost kind of, a, as we look down the road, it's essential for us to find a, a pipeline of really talented leaders. Mm. And I think we've had great success across many schools here in the U.S. Uh, obviously, I spent a lot of time here recruiting at Ross, but I'll tell you, we found a lot of uh, very talented MBAs across many schools, and uh, it's a great pipeline to bring in new talent. And Amazon are, is recruiting quite a few MBAs these days. Quite a few, <laughs> quite a few, yes. Uh, I think the... You know, a lot of that has to do with the fact that the schools, I think, are really uh, helping build really uh, talented professionals. And by the time people leave here, uh, I'm amazed at how big the roles are that people take. If I were to compare it to when I graduated uh, 20 years ago, I think people are much more prepared to jump into an operating role and make a big difference. I know we're going to talk a little bit more about that on the panel later on, but right. uh, we're very, very pleased with the, the results of our MBA hiring. And Peter, you're a perfect segue to Ellis because you actually started at McKinsey True. out of the Ross program. Yeah. <laughs> so Ellis, you know, McKinsey has been really one of the pioneer recruiters of MBAs from the earliest days of Marvin Bauer. Uh, what, what is it about the MBA that makes, uh, makes that person so well prepared to jump into a consulting role at McKinsey? I'd say it's a couple of things. Um, the real core and the real essence of it is around problem solving. 
And it's the ability to look at a problem from 360 degrees and walk around it and take a lot of different perspectives. Not a single perspective, not one way into a problem, but to look at it from multiple disciplines and to really have that kind of um, ability is something super unique about the MBA. And I think really why we have continued and continued and continued for many years um, to pursue MBAs. And Grant, at Google, uh, what do you expect from an MBA that you might not expect from a non-MBA applicant? Well, well, frankly, I don't necessarily feel comfortable speaking for all of Google, but at X in particular, we're in the business of launching startups. And there is a, a breadth of a skill set that individuals come out with from an MBA program mm -hmm. that makes them useful. We, we try to have small, easily fungible teams. So having someone who has some background in operations, some in marketing, some in accounting, equally facile at looking at a user interview and, and a P&L and figuring out how to do manufacturing, that really makes a person valuable in a place where we might have to kill a project and pivot that person in six months. And Scott, as Dean, I imagine you, you make a very conscious effort in terms of how you're shaping the people who go through the program for employers like these. Without question. I mean, at the end of the day, it's our responsibility to ensure that we're developing talent that creates a pipeline for companies like Amazon, McKinsey, and Google, uh, because that's our partnership. Uh, and we have to be able to understand where they're going in their business and then understand what are the experiences we need to provide students to ready them for those experiences. The adaptability that Grant's talking about, the ability to step into big roles and functions at an Amazon within a year or two running really big businesses and operations. With McKinsey, being able to have the skill set to work with clients and take the unstructured to create structure and solve that problem. These are the demands that they need to be able to do their business, uh, and it's our responsibility and our opportunity to develop talent who is ready and prepared to take on those roles. In a way, I mean, you use the military metaphor, in a way I would say uh, an MBA makes a person combat ready uh, to immediately jumpstart his or her career. I mean, because you really not only get the basics, you get through experiential learning, a taste mm -hmm. of different opportunities and what's expected of you, so that when you hire an MBA, you know that person's gonna perform from day one, mm -hmm. which is very different from when you hire someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, Ellis, let me ask you how the opportunities and responsibilities of an MBA hire has changed over the years. Do, are they, do they assume greater responsibility today than they may have five, 10, 15 years ago? I really like your combat ready. So I feel sometimes like you're combat ready, and when you drop in on day one, it is for all time since the time of Marvin Bauer, Ben, that you are ready to jump in and participate completely fully. So, um, so that, I would say, has not changed. What's changed, though, is the context and what really the expectation is and what client expectations are, that we come in with a totally interdisciplinary approach, that you walk in kind of ready to problem solve um, in a global scale, to look at issues from all different levels, to have an analytical capability that is really, um, really quite excellent. So I think in some ways there have been shifts and still kind of that problem, re problem solving, ready day one um, is still fundamental. And Peter, at Amazon, I know that uh, when MBAs come into Amazon, they're immediately given their little area to experiment in, right? That's right. I think, you know, your question is how has it changed over time? And yeah. I think when I was getting my MBA here, there were a lot of companies that you could go work for after getting your MBA who had management training programs. Right. And a lot of them were very well regarded and a lot of, you know, super good companies. You kind of imagine the mental model was, get your MBA for a couple of years, be part of a management training program, and eventually be put into an operating role. And I think uh, both McKinsey in a different way, but certainly the tech companies, the models changed radically. You know, the, the operating role begins the day you begin with Amazon, in mm -hmm. our case. And we do expect people to be able to hit the ground running. And so I think there's, there's even more importance of during your MBA making sure that you learn how to handle ambiguity, that you learn how to actually get things done, <laughs> that you learn how to experiment, that you're ready to become an operator, that you learn how to work well with others, because there aren't training programs to teach you that once you get on the ground. We right. kind of expect that you're coming in. The reason we hire an MBA is that we expect that you have built those skills over time yeah. and that you're ready to roll. Right. And so it's exciting. I think in many ways, 
this may be a great time to be an MBA because if I think back about the training programs, they just sort of delayed you getting to do what you really want to do, That's which is true. you really want to go lead something. You That's really want to go build something. You want to go create something. And right now, I think is a great time because you graduate. Trust me, you work for any of these three companies, uh, you'll feel very valued very quickly. It's like another graduate degree on <laughs> your resume, really, to be Absolutely. at any, any one of the three companies. Yeah. And, and I think it's worth pointing out to people out there who may not know that probably in the last quarter of a century, there's been a major reduction in training programs and rotational programs at many companies. Mm -hmm. uh, these companies become much leaner, uh, and I think that's one of the major reasons why the MBA is the most popular graduate degree in America, mm -hmm. and why the business major is the most popular major uh, undergrad. Uh, because people really want those who can contribute immediately in their workforce. Mm -hmm. Okay, at Google, uh, let me get your perspective on, is the, is the business model for the MBA um, ideal the way it is, or should it change? Peter and I were actually chatting about this yesterday, that because of that lack of training, you actually expect people to come in a little bit closer to combat ready. It, that said, you also have an element where you want people to be willing to take risks, to be willing to try things, to be willing to potentially fail, and not to, uh, not to lack that resilience and ability to pick themselves up afterwards. So where I think the business school model has evolved that has been quite helpful is in providing that safe space and encouraging that risk taking, mm. encouraging that, that bias towards action and that attempt to get those results in an environment that is mostly harmless if you fail. That way, when you come out to an Amazon, when you come out to a McKinsey, when you come out to a Google, and you face plant, because you will, it's not the first time that you've done it, and you know exactly how to pick yourself back up, and you know that you have the both hard and soft skill set to rely on to push that forward. And this speaks to the whole medical school analogy where people have a residency. Mm -hmm. And today they have uh, projects, assignments, uh, with deliverables that make them accountable. Uh, and as you say, allow them to practice without harming too many people. <laughs> Scott, do you, you think that's an essential part of an MBA experience and how business schools are changing, right? Without question. The, the analogy to, to medical education, I think, is an astute one. Uh, teaching hospitals. Right. right? Same concept. Yeah. Uh, and if you think about why that's important, the skill sets that are being described by uh, the, the panel uh, the, how do you develop those skills? You develop that skill of the resiliency, uh, being tolerant of ambiguity, understanding how to learn from my mistakes, et cetera, by actually doing it. The other reason that becomes valuable is to an earlier uh, panel and the conversation around how many students, MBA students today, are making some switch in their life using the MBA as a platform. So I often talk about experiential learning as an opportunity to try before you buy because you may not have worked in consulting, you may not have worked in tech. And so it's an opportunity to develop those skills while you're in school but also to experiment with who you want to be. You put those two things together and the teaching hospital model becomes really important. Because in residency, what you're doing is you're going to a surger surgery rotation, you're going to a pediatric rotation, et cetera, <laughs> being able to develop those skills but then also getting to try. And so at Ross, one of the things that we've really committed ourselves to is building the most robust portfolio of experiential learning opportunities so that we're developing talent uh, to meet these needs and to meet the needs of those students who are coming in for the education. And in fact, you just made a major change in how you do that. Want to describe that? Sure, so our, our goal, our aspiration for the school is that every student who walks through our doors has the opportunity to start real businesses, invest real capital in real assets, whether it be equity, real estate, new ventures, et cetera. Uh, so we have students running investment funds uh, with real capital. Uh, we want every student to have the opportunity to advise real companies on real strategic issues so when they go work for McKinsey, they've already done it. So our students will do roughly 200 consulting projects this year for organizations all around the globe as part of the curriculum. Uh, and then the, the, uh, the, one of the biggest uh, innovations that we've done here in the last uh, year or so uh, is we started building businesses inside the business school uh, in partnership with leading brands, leading companies, where we want our students leading real teams and real functions and real businesses where you're learning marketing as we develop the marketing strategy and implement it for a real business. 
and students are getting this ongoing experience with companies. So, you know, we've got both undergraduate and graduate students now working in teams, uh, cross functions in actual companies building businesses. You know, we've got uh, Shinola, which is a Michigan based company, uh, and their headphone business, which launched uh, this uh, past holiday season. We've got 24 Michigan Ross students, uh, as well as students from design, engineering, et cetera, uh, working in that business, reporting to the head of audio, who reports to the CEO, who happens to be an alum. And we've got faculty embedded, it's part of the curriculum, and they are working in four functions, marketing, supply chain operations, digital e-commerce, and uh, back office finance accounting. And we've got marketing faculty teaching marketing strategy as they build and implement it for the audio business for Shinola. We're doing that with Shinola, we're doing it with Ford, we're doing it with uh, the, one of the largest affordable housing developers in the country. Uh, we're doing it with, uh, we're building a job placement and training service for survivors of human trafficking. Our goal is to have a dozen of these businesses up and running and we have eight uh, right now. And so we're building what I think is, is going to be one of the most robust portfolio of, portfolios of experiential learning uh, through the start, invest, advise, and lead uh, framework so that we can build talent that can be ready on day one for these organizations. Peter, don't you wish they had that when you graduated in 1995? Uh, yeah, among many things. Uh, this beautiful, uh, I know you can't see it on the live cast, but trust us, we're in the most beautiful business school building really I've ever are. seen. So. Uh, I think I saw sushi downstairs, just to give you a clear flavor of how far things Starbucks. have changed. Yeah. We had hot dogs, just to give you the comparison. So. <laughs> but uh, at, at Amazon, um, what's, your, what's your point of view about how well educated MBAs are and how well prepared they are? And, yeah. and can they be better prepared? Is there something else that, that business school should be doing to them? I think so. And I think uh, we've kind of hit it on in the panel. I think the. I, the one thing I'll say to the audience is that if you get into one of these business schools, Yale, uh, Haas Berkeley, and, and uh, Michigan Ross, uh, you're very, very smart. Uh, there's no question at the intelligence level, you have the intelligence to be successful at any one of these companies up here. I honestly think if I were to simplify it, the make or break part is, do you develop the skills to be able to get stuff done? You know, right. it's one thing to be very smart intellectually, it's one thing to be very book smart, but do you have the ability to work with others, uh, put together an inspirational plan, uh, as we talked about earlier, experiment a lot, fail a lot, learn a lot, and be persistent and end up with something wonderful in time. And I think one of the areas I would love to see all business schools focus on more is this purposeful failure. You know, most of our academic careers were all propped up to be successful. You want mm -hmm. your children to get good grades, you want to get good grades, the professors want you to get good grades. Everything's kind of centered on don't get a bad grade, get a good grade. And I think somehow we need to change the incentive system so that part of your getting a good grade is demonstrating the ability to experiment, to fail, and, and, and pull back and see what you learn from it. Yeah, because point. the reality is, you know, if you want to invent something truly unbelievable and inspirational, you're going to fail nine times out of ten. And uh, but so we want to train people to be really good at failing, learning from them, and, and bouncing back up and, and going again. And so I'd love to see you know, in Scott's model of you can start a business, you can invest in a business, you can consult in a business. I think that's an awesome place to start. And I think allowing students to learn from these experiences is going to make them super well prepared to hit the ground running. Great point. And you know what I love about this discussion. You know, 25 years ago, when you were thinking about an MBA, not to, not, yeah. not, not to give any clue about your age, yeah. okay? But when you were thinking about an MBA, we would be talking about finance and statistics mm -hmm. and accounting and, mm -hmm. and marketing. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking about solving problems. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking about uh, rolling up your sleeves and getting really involved in the challenges that a business might face. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about working in teams and, and, and being a great collaborator. Uh, the whole conversation has changed, and the whole sort of thrust of what an MBA is has changed. And that's, that's just really exciting, I think. Mm -hmm. So, Ellis, a lot of people go into consulting uh, from a different industry. How, how important is the MBA in allowing someone to make that often difficult transition that they probably can't make without the MBA? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and also actually builds a little bit on, on what we were just hearing. 
I think when I started um, an MBA, which was not that far from when you started your MBA, um, <laughs> was, uh, you know, I thought, I'm going to go and I'm going to learn some mechanics of how a business works. I don't know all of the ins and outs of all of these different pieces, and I'm, I'm going to learn about them. What I didn't really expect was to necessarily learn about me. Yep. And I think that is the big transition. That's the big switch. And you, see, you take this time when you think, I could learn about some of these things that are really technical and tactical. You could probably learn about those lots of different ways. But when you learn about yourself and how you put yourself in that situation, in that problem, and what you contribute. So, um, so I think there's a switch. There's a little bit that is absolutely about kind of the mechanics of how business works, but it's also about where I see myself and my place and how I can contribute both um, kind of to the business community and to the community at large. And so a lot of this talking about innovation and about how we find different spaces, um, that makes a huge difference. So the transition really from having sort of a single focus, which is you know my industry background and experience, to having a broad focus in which you could be asked to do really anything in any discipline is much more about how you see yourself in that problem. Yeah, that's a really good answer because I think one of the underestimated aspects of business education is the amount of introspection mm -hmm. that you're guided through. There is no right. other academic discipline, not even psychology or philosophy, <laughs> that guides its students so carefully through a journey of who am I, yep. what am I best at, and mm -hmm. what should I do devote my life to. Grant, you're the most recent graduate. Did you go through that experience? I, I did, and I think there's, there's an element that I got out of Ross and out of business school in particular, which was, um, a bias towards action, right? There's a, what we want when we're looking for people is not people who will look at the theory and become potentially paralyzed by the amount of information that they can find in any particular area, but people who are willing to think about and apply the Colin Powell rule, the, the 4070 of, hey, I need to make sure I'm in that sweet spot of information, not wait until there's too much, not make the call too early, but be able to take a stance when the time is appropriate. And I think going through it, having the ability to advise real companies, having the ability to go in and invest real capital, lets you experiment with your own uh, methodologies or modes of doing that and say, hey, all right, maybe I pulled the trigger too late there, maybe I pulled the trigger too early here, and now I'm finally finding that sweet spot personally mm -hmm. so that I know where I'm, a where I'm able and comfortable to do that. Right. And, it, I mean, and the, the key to get there is, so you, you have to be able to provide the experience. And in effect, what we're talking about is instead of reading about a case study of something that happened in the past, you are the case study. And so you're developing the business tools and skills, but you're also going through this very personal transformation process in the experience. But to enable that personal transformation to happen, you have to surround that with the coaching, the feedback, the assessment that's necessary to make sure that we're learning from that experience. Because Ellis and I can be in the exact same experience, but learn fundamentally different amounts, different lessons, etc. And so it's about what we surround that experience with in terms of that mentorship, the coaching, the assessment, the feedback that enables you that when you do face plant and fall down, to get back up and develop that adaptive capability and that resilience so that next time you do it when you're at Michigan Ross or Yale or Berkeley, you're better at it. And then by the time you get to McKinsey, Amazon, or Google, you're better at it. Yeah. Uh, and you've learned about yourself in a really fundamental way. Uh, because I mean, we're not only developing business people, but we're developing a human capability here that I think is really important. Mm -hmm. Right. So Peter, how, how important is pre-experience uh, MBA in your hiring decisions? In other words, um, you're a tech company. Uh, does a person who have, who's had engineering experience, for example, uh, as, a, as the foundation and then got an MBA. Is that more valuable to Amazon or not? It is. No, I think it's, uh, it's funny because that's not my education background. Right. And uh, if I were to go back and rewind it, uh, although I love what I did, uh, probably having a harder uh, science discipline undergrad and coming back to get your MBA right now would be a great combination. You know? yeah. Uh, I, you know, I don't know how you say it, mathematics and computer science are the new sexy for an undergrad degree. You combine that with an MBA and you're super well prepared, I think, to be able to build and launch things uh, in terms of a technology company. But I think, you know, uh, many students make the judgment about whether they should get their MBA and how much work experience they need. And from the, the students we've hired, I think that three to five years of experience prior to getting your MBA is super critical. You do want to have enough real-world experience that you've learned how things work, 
maybe you've had some success, maybe you've had some failures, you have a reference point of how, thing, you know, how things worked in whatever industry you were in, and I think you're, much, you're able to provide a richer experience for yourself and for your fellow students and for the faculty when you come back with that kind of experience base. Right. So we don't necessarily, the one thing I will say is, although we obviously love the hard science piece, uh, we also, and I, I think the other companies do as well, we also have a completely open mind. If you happen to have a, you know, a, a background in, in the arts or uh, something other than the hard sciences, uh, we really center on who the person is, not necessarily what, what mm -hmm. it looks like on their resume. So I think the, the MBA gives you a chance to restart and replant yourself if you figured out a little bit further down the line what you want to go do. It is a great opportunity for you to career switch, if you will. Right. McKinsey, I'm sure it's the same there. <laughs> Just the same. Um, I was a Japanese studies major, so wow. <laughs> I'm not sure, not sure how that's helpful great. that's actually ever been. <laughs> so I, okay. I can work in the Peace Corps and then uh, get my MBA, and you're not going to hold that against me. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I think that absolutely it's, it's, are, are some of those fundamental things important, kind of what was, what was your major, where did you work, um, what's the work that you've done, um, you know, how did you do in school? Of course, those things are fundamentals and those are, those are important. I think also though, um, just as a, a small reframe of it, I think that the idea of your story and who you are and how you write that story and how you tell that story mm -hmm. and who you want to become and how you're, you have charted a path toward that, even if you were a Japanese studies major and um, worked, I worked at the American Cancer Society, worked in nonprofit, I mean, whatever that story is, how you write it and how you chart it really matters and is, is really, um, people are looking for inspiration um, as well as sort of just, just the evidence of action. And Grant, how important is the internship? I know a lot of companies mm -hmm. today uh, like to try out MBAs mm -hmm. uh, over summer and decide whether or not to give them a full-time offer. Uh, is that true at Google? It is true at Google. And, and frankly, in my situation, it's more common that someone has not been in a strategic or operational role before, has done an internship somewhere like McKinsey or somewhere doing an operational role, and says, hey, I think I've checked that box. Do I have enough experience to come in and do that role in your organization? And, and the answer is relatively unsatisfactory, but it depends. It depends on what your experience was before that MBA. Do you have additional experience that you can lead to it? It depends on your story. Are you telling a consistent story about how you've gained those skills? Do you have that commitment to putting in the work to show that if you're coming to tech and you did not have the, the hard science background, are you taking coding classes? Are you, learn, are you advising startups in the Ann Arbor or Detroit region? Because there's plenty of them. And are you taking the steps to be able to tell that consistent story? If so, then an internship might be plenty of experience. If not, then you might want to turn that internship into a full-time gig, get those hard skills with that organization, and then figure out how to pivot from a consulting role, an operational role, into the tech industry. Okay, Grant, you're only six years out of the MBA program, and you have one of the coolest jobs in the world. I mean, head of strategy at Google's Moonshot Factory. <laughs> How'd you get that job? <laughs> uh, a lot of good fortune. Um, <laughs> and, uh, honestly, I think there is an, an element of two things that I want to say specifically about the MBA. One, a lot of humility was instilled into me through, this, through my process and journey going through business school. Uh, not just the face plans that I experienced, but the ability to take leadership roles among my peers, find out how to build consensus among people who might have drastically differing opinions about how we do a, a map project or how we submit a, a, a team uh, project in a particular class, but also just the ability to realize then that I should admit when I'm ignorant. And actually that is a strength that I have now coming out of the MBA, going in and saying, I do not know, but I have the capability to learn rapidly and that makes me more valuable. Um, Secondarily, I think what I did is, uh, oftentimes people come into an MBA and try to switch industry and role. I had consulting experience and nonprofit experience before, so I knew I wanted to do something strategic that would have an impact. Could I have gone into Google X in the strategy role right out of an MBA? Probably not. I didn't know technology. I didn't know how startups worked. What I needed to do was go into Google's BizOps team, which is their corporate strategy group, learn that world, do a couple projects from there with X, and then make the transition over. So if you think about, 
I know we're all in a hurry to get to the end state and where we think we want to be, but if you look at that North Star and your next step takes you within 30 degrees of that, that's probably the right next step. You do not need to make that jump all in one. And if you can tell the consistent story of how that next step gets you there, it's going to be even more valuable as you do it. So were you, when you were in school, did you have an internship at Google? I actually interned with the Civic Consulting Alliance, which oh. is a, a nonprofit organization that does consulting, offers pro bono consulting for the city of Chicago and Cook County. Wow. So through that experience, that solidified that I wanted to have impact at scale, but technology was likely the way to do it seeing how some of the systems and processes worked in, you know, arguably one of the more forward-thinking local governments, they were still dependent upon a relatively slow rate of adoption of technology to have that impact that they wanted to. And then your first job with an MBA was? Coming out to Google. Wow. Yep. How about that? So I'm sure you believe that if you didn't have an MBA, you wouldn't have your current role. I would be nowhere close to my current role today. We knew him when. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, let's get into a question that I think every uh, MBA and every applicant ultimately wants to hear. Uh, what do MBAs do at Amazon in their first year um, at your company? <laughs> well, uh, one thing I'll, uh, I'll say before I give some examples is that I think it is important to get to know the, the companies that come on campus because you might be surprised by the breadth of roles and opportunities they have. In other words, we try not to just partner with one club here at Michigan, as an example. Like, it'd be obvious for us to partner with the technology club. But the reality is we hire HR leaders here, finance leaders, product leaders, operations leaders. If you name a discipline within Amazon, we hire every single one of those roles mm. here on campus. And so we actually spend a fair amount of time with the career counselors and with lots of different groups of students talking about each of these different areas. And we encourage them to kind of explore uh, the breadth of Amazon because we're convinced uh, many students here would find a particular part of Amazon they could fall in love with and, and would want to go do something. But the, the part that I hire primarily are usually uh, product leaders. And examples of people who take a product leader role at Amazon, uh, we hired a, a Ross MBA a few years ago to come launch the wine business on Amazon. So we gave this person an ambiguous project. We want to start selling wine. Uh, which turns out it's very hard to do uh, <laughs> on the internet. We gave them a very small technology team and we said, uh, we've got the launch date all set for you, which is so <laughs> kind of us. And you've got about nine months to get this thing ready and, and off the ground. Wow. And it's kind of one of these rocket ship roles. You know, you, you have to be able to handle ambiguity. You have to be able to be uh, energized and ready to roll. Uh, we also hired, just as another example, um, we hired a, a Ross MBA to lead the pricing technology we use for all these small businesses and entrepreneurs who sell their products on Amazon. And it's a really big deal because we help uh, these entrepreneurs uh, price their products competitively. We help them do it in a way that's automated so that they don't have mm. to spend time manually doing their, their pricing. And it's a, it's a program, obviously, that if you didn't do well, you could cost people a lot of money if you, right. if you messed up their prices. And so um, both of these are, are kind of entrepreneurial examples of real operating roles that we would send you into right from the very beginning. And so our internship roles and our full-time roles, uh, they're not roles that are designed as uh, small roles to get you up to speed on the business. These are like real operating roles that if we don't put you in, we're going to put another operator in. Right. And we're, we need someone to deliver uh, something of substance, usually pretty quickly. So they're very big very meaty, very exciting roles. Wow. Yeah, you'll feel very valued right from the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Ellis, what does a first year consultant at McKinsey do? Feel valued, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I think traditionally you think that you, you walk in and you're just a GR generalist consultant and that has been our most frequent sort of path and so much has changed over the years. There is still a generalist consulting track um, but we also have many other options. We have general management, um, we have financial management, uh, we have practices that you can go directly into, digital practices, we have technology companies, um, digital companies that, that are part of the McKinsey family. So, uh, so it is much broader. I would say no matter where you go, you will be solving difficult problems. Um, you will be working with a team, you will be innovating, um, you will spend a lot of time in a team room, much like the ones that are here at business school, um, working with other people, collaborating, listening to ideas, 
de developing solutions and tr using every single skill that you acquire through your MBA in that first, I was going to say minute, but I'll go with month. That's great. <laughs> you know, we, we have an annual event at Poets and Cons called the Pre-MBA Networking Festival. Uh, and one of my favorite moments is uh, McKinsey is a participant, so is Amazon and Google. But one of my favorite moments is when they brought out a young consultant who opened up her Outlook calendar and showed how she spent a week, an average week. Mm -hmm. How much time with clients, how much time doing PowerPoint presentations, how much time with her team, how much time traveling. And it's a real eye-opening experience mm -hmm. uh, to see exactly what you're spending your time on yeah. uh, as a newly hired MBA at McKinsey. Mm -hmm. um, pretty cool. <laughs> All right, Grant, your, your first job at Google, mm -hmm. what did you do? I was in the group called BizOps, uh, right. Business Operations and Strategy. And it essentially is, I like to call them recovering consultants. <laughs> so it is folks who have decided to make the leap from a, a consulting background, typically, uh, sometimes banking, sometimes other analytical or quantitative roles, uh, into a strategic and operational role within the tech company. So we were the SWAT team going in and figuring out relatively thorny problems around Google. And frankly, just to set expectations, I was an associate coming out. I, I was doing very similar work when I graduated my MBA as I did when I went into consulting out of undergrad. Now, the path to advancement and the path to managing teams was far quicker, and I felt far better at the role than I did when I first came out and did it as an undergrad, but it definitely was a, a very interesting um, reset. So one of the things that we all work for very glamorous companies that have lots of people who are excited and chomping at the bit to come work for us. That means we get very qualified people. That means sometimes we can hire overqualified people for the role that we are looking at and potentially it might chafe some individuals a bit. So when, we, when you come out, that humility, that, uh, that skill set that you develop within an MBA from your previous experience, you just need to trust that the best folks will advance. And if you feel like the role you're doing is something that is not fully utilizing your talents, show how you can fully utilize those talents. Mm -hmm. Good advice. Now, Peter, when I think about your career, and I think of the places you've been and the things that you've done at McKinsey, at Ford, at Amazon, uh, I imagine that if you didn't have an MBA, your journey in life would have been quite different. I think you're absolutely right, and I, I do feel, I think Grant said it earlier, I feel very blessed to have the path I, I, I've had and the opportunities I've had because they're not, uh, not everyone gets these same opportunities. Yeah. So you realize how lucky you are in life. I think when I think back about the, you know, the MBA here, I still can remember being here maybe a couple of weeks and a company reach out to you on email that wouldn't have talked to you 30 days prior. Right. You know, so it's, it's, it's dramatic. You know, I remember saying, wow, these guys are so interested. If I had just sent them my resume a month ago, I wouldn't have gotten a response. And so it's exciting. It's a, it's a very fun opportunity. And I think, you know, the, the, the part I think I, I ended up getting right was you do have two years, as Ellis talked about, to work on yourself, to get you to know yourself better, and to really figure out what is it that you want to learn. And for me, there were a couple of areas, I'll give you an example, there were some areas of the business world like corporate finance that were a little bit mystifying to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked at an ad agency and in sales prior to coming back to B school, I didn't have any experience in corporate finance. So it was great to take a corporate finance class because it was sort of like, okay, I, I think I actually do understand this, you know? But it's an opportunity for you to be able to learn this and grow your skills and build your skills. And then it goes without saying, I think it, it, all business schools do this well nowadays, but you do need to learn how to work effectively with people. You do need to how to uh, lead uh, teams and maybe most importantly, lead and influence peers. You know, this right. is what the real world is. You're gonna be out in whatever company you choose to go to with a lot of other very smart people. Probably for most MBAs, they may have 10 or 15 years on you. So your ability to be successful is gonna depend greatly on your ability to uh, work well and influence others uh, so that you can deliver a great result. Is there anything an MBA candidate can do right now uh, to help make themselves more competitive uh, as a candidate for your company. Ellis? Um, I think absolutely. And I think it starts with that core of knowing yourself and telling your story. Um, it starts with kind of how you're going to be an innovative person in this world and what's kind of your place and how do you contribute to the community at large. And really knowing that and solidifying that, 
um, even before you begin is great. Um, I think I might come from the opposite place that you came from. I actually started and I thought, I am going to learn finance. And I'm, I'll admit I'm coming out right now. I am not an amazing math person. Um, it's true. And uh, I We know you're a poet. You majored in <laughs> Japanese Just go study. with poet. Let's <laughs> do it. Let's just say it. But I was, I was committed and I was sat through this finance class and I looked at everybody who looked just like Peter getting excited like, I get this. And I thought, I do not get this. <laughs> I just, I do not. And I was freaking out. I've come to the wrong school. This is not good. And, um, and I actually at that moment went and talked to my advisor here and I, and I was like, you know, all these org classes are so easy, but finance, I got to beat it. I gotta, I'm going to get it. And, and at the time she said, you, you know, it, it might be that they're not easy for everyone. I was like, no, no, I'm sure they're easy. Nope, not easy for everyone. This might be your thing. Maybe you're not a finance guru. You can pass fine. You'll do fine. But maybe you found your thing. And I think that idea of like, wow, so I did. And I started and then I kind of went into the HR field and really focused on org consulting when I came out um, of business school. So that idea of making yourself competitive by making yourself you is absolutely the key to me. John, it's, just to add to this, uh, if I look at where our students are gravitating towards, um, over the last several years, we started offering a couple of opportunities that the students opt into. And I always think students vote with their feet, right? And they'll find value where, they, where it is. So we have a program that we launched called Story Lab. Uh, it's out of our Sanger Leadership Center. And it's all about helping students find and discover their story and be able to tell that story. And not just in an interview context, but just life generally. Mm -hmm. And I think we had 700 students uh, participate in some form or another mm -hmm. this year alone in some version of Story Lab, uh, which is interesting because it's all about them d discovering their story and being able to tell that story. Mm -hmm. And then uh, through our Center for Positive Organizations, we have this tool uh, that's called the Reflected Best Self. And it's sort of in the strengths finders realm, mm -hmm. right? But what it asks you to do is to go solicit stories from people in your life, personal, professional, et cetera, and they tell stories about when they saw you at your best. And then you derive from that a set of themes that are the strengths that I often take for granted. Right? And what makes you unique is different than what makes you unique. And students are voting with their feet where they're, they're asking and demanding for these opportunities as a way to discover those strengths, to be able to craft their career, not only in the short term, but also thinking about long term, the path that I want to be on. Uh, and what's interesting is we're seeing that in schools like Ross and others, but then companies. I mean, to, to, to hear you describe what you look for and the ability to tell a story is the same thing our admissions teams is, are, are looking for on the front end, right? And, uh, and I, I think for prospective students, I think that's a really powerful mm -hmm. uh, lesson and insight coming from both the companies as well as the schools. Be you and do you really well. And, and on my end, I think actually there's such an obvious dissonance when the story that you're trying to be told and the passion of the person who's telling it to you are different. <laughs> it is so obvious when someone is saying, hey, I really want to work in tech. And you look at their resume and it has not, not a knock on it, but you know, majored in marketing, focused on marketing, internship in marketing, did head of the marketing club. And you say, all right, tech marketing is something you could do. Why is strategy the role that you might want here? And they're trying to say, with their feet, I have voted, but I'm holding a backup plan and you know, this opportunity looks interesting and sexy. So what I advise people, Say you want to be a consultant, you want to go to McKinsey, you want to go to Bain. What is the skill gap between you and a really excellent consultant today? And how can you knock that down during the, the two years you have at an MBA to be able to go in and authoritatively say to Ellis, I am going to crush it here. I am going to be a phenomenal consultant. I have advised companies. I have built the quant background to be able to do this. Frankly, I've been mentored by someone who's already at this company and I feel like I would be able to step in on day one and be valuable. If you can tell that story, if you can follow and build up, identify the gaps in your skill set and close those, it's so easy to tell the people who've put in that work versus the people who have not. And what's amazing about that is that all of that has almost nothing to do with fitting in a mold mm -hmm. or fitting a single profile. Mm -hmm. Almost nothing. Yep. So Grant, you must have ESP because you just answered the first question from our live stream audience, <laughs> which, which is what advice would MBA candidates, uh, would you have for MBA candidates as they approach their MBA journey? 
Scott, what advice would you give? Well, what I would, one piece of advice I would offer students is to use the MBA as an opportunity to explore. Uh, I think a lot of students come in with uh, a fairly narrow view of I'm going to be X or I'm going to be Y. Uh, mi most students shift uh, while they're in school and then shortly after school. And I think the two years that you spend in an MBA program is a wonderful opportunity to expose yourself to different content like corporate finance that you may not understand or, or, or appreciate. Uh, to expose yourself to people who are in different careers that you've never even heard of. Uh, and to uh, build a, an experience set as opposed to a skill set that allows you to discover the path that you want to follow both in the short term and the long term. Uh, I think that uh, requires an openness to experience uh, that uh, would be one of my uh, main pieces of advice for our students. Mm -hmm. Peter, your advice? Well, um, I'm going to go a little bit uh, kind of at a different angle, which is I think sometimes I see students trying to optimize for the company name or the title or the money. And I would do something completely different, which is I would find what you love, mm. and I would really try to align yourself so you can go do that. You know, I think eventually the people I've met who are the most successful really actually really love what they do, and you know, they don't view it, they don't view it as an occupation or right. work. They actually love the environment they're in. And I will tell you, when I graduated from here and I worked for McKinsey, and these last 12 years at Amazon, I'm really happy. You know, and I think I'm really happy in my professional life, which obviously helps uh, also enable great happiness in your personal life. But I think, you know, I, I feel like uh, don't allow yourself to make a compromise for something that will be more short-term oriented. Find something that you love, find some way you can make a big difference in the world, and go do that. Yeah, really good advice. Yeah, and I, was, I was just going to add only one thing, which is as you approach this journey, approach it with full openness. Mm -hmm. And that no one of those things that Peter just talked about is the one thing that matters. It's not about money and it's not about status and it's not about that one particular job. It's about optimizing for all of those and who you are and how you fit into that equation. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think I can't tell you in words how much I admire my classmate who opened a, a um, in downtown Manhattan a cupcake and beer pairing restaurant. I just can't even tell you how wow, that's happy that makes me. And apparently they're good together. But, but there, are, there are infinite possibilities and not one. And while goals are good and having a goal is good, um, a singular goal as you enter this journey actually can hold you back from finding what's really going to inspire you. Can I add one piece to that as well? Yeah. Get, get out of this castle. Get, this campus is beautiful, but get out of this castle and go explore the academic institution where you are, right? Michigan is phenomenal, I'll speak to it because it has a number of top 10 graduate schools. I took classes or was in extracurriculars with people from the School of Education, the School of Natural Resources and Environment, uh, the School of Public Management, the school, I, they, I basically was trying to get myself as broad of an education as I could while I was still going after my MBA. Many business schools are in similar environments. Don't just hole up with your business school classmates. Go out and try and take full advantage of the full institution. Hmm. That's, That's really good. Okay, here's our last question from the audience. Do you think an MBA is more, less, or equally as valuable as the day that you received yours? Scott. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I, I, I admittedly I am biased uh, in, this, uh, in this conversation. Um, but uh, I, I think the MBA uh, from a, from a uh, top school is as valuable as it's ever been. Uh, so uh, many students, uh, prospective students, current students, think about the short-term value of that first job, basically. Uh, so the career placement, the salaries, those sorts of things. Uh, but I think even longer term than that, um, the personal transformation that can happen, uh, the community that you're part of, I think that's an underappreciated uh, aspect of business schools generally, is you are part of now a lifelong community uh, of really talented professionals who care deeply about that community. Uh, and I think that's a really important uh, piece of the value equation. Uh, but the return on investment is an important calculation for everyone. Uh, MBAs are not cheap. 
Uh, and, and so you have to think about what the return on that is. And I think the pressure in business education today is on schools that can't uh, justify or warrant uh, a return on the investment that you have to make. Uh, but if you look at the top 10, 15, 20 schools that are out there, whether you look at short-term career metrics, things of that sort, or you look at long-term value, uh, the value, I think, is as strong as it's ever been. And, and I think too many people make the calculation based on starting salary and bonus and not on the long-term benefits to one's total professional career as, as well as one's personal development That's as, a, exactly as a human right. being exactly who, right. can, who could really contribute to society. Yep. Uh, Peter. I'm going to change the question, if you don't mind. This is Absolutely. a famous technique. Go slightly, for it. But, uh, is it I, I thought they only do that in consulting, not in I thought, Amazon. Well, I, I thought it was politics. I couldn't, I couldn't remember where it was. I think the, uh, answer the question you want to answer, Peter. That's the key. <laughs> That's what I've been talking <laughs> I think that, you know, is an MBA as valuable kind of goes across all MBA programs. And I have a different mental model, which is I think these top-tier schools, including the three, uh, Yale, uh, House Berkeley, and Michigan, they're as valuable today as they were uh, back when I got mine in 95. But I do think there's been a, uh, a large number of MBA programs that have been added and yes. lots of options and online options and, and it's dizzying. Yeah. And I think you, you should be, uh, as a particular candidate, you should be discerning. You have to find a school that you think is gonna push uh, you and push your thinking and help you learn. And I love these schools that are pushing the envelope on how to learn more interactively because I think the old days of you're sitting in a, a big room and you're doing case studies and that's the beginning and the end of your education, uh, that model is uh, old fashioned model and not very useful. So I'd right. say if you're gonna go get one of those MBAs, uh, you, might not, you might not be uh, getting your money's worth. But I think the high, the high ROI MBA programs are still as valuable today as they were 20 years ago. Very, very valuable. And Ellis, as head of inclusion and diversity at McKinsey, I'm thinking that Frankly, an MBA is great for someone who's making a transition, who is from a less traditional field, uh, who may be in a, from a part of the world or from an ethnic or origin uh, that's different from the norm or the mainstream, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there are, if I, if I use your rephrase to talk about but a high value <laughs> ed, I guess you said MBA <laughs> programs, I, would, I might even give it a more. Yeah. Um, as my answer, because I do think that it provides opportunities that maybe we didn't know about almost 20 years ago, but I'm not saying 20 years ago because it sounds like too long, but, um, but that we really didn't know about. So the application of an MBA is so broad across so many industries, so many sectors, across so many different types of world problems in government agencies. Uh, it's really, um, it really does have a hugely broad applicability that I'm not sure is the way that we thought of it, you know, back then. Um, so just a little bit, um, you know, I, th I do think it's a little bit different and I do think it gives us the opportunity to um, level a playing field. People come to school, MBA programs are eager to have people from diverse backgrounds um, to come to those schools um, and then levels that playing field as a starting point for people to gain sort of an equal access to that education and jump off from there, which is really, really important to kind of the continued development of the corporate sector as well from a just a diversity perspective. Can I add to that yeah. just, just for a moment? So if you think about leveling the playing field on the front end, and then you think about what business as an institution in society can do. Uh, the private sector represents roughly, in the US, 80% of the GDP. Uh, government, uh, roughly 19%, nonprofit sector and, and NGOs, et cetera, roughly 1%, right? So if you think about the power of business in society, I would propose that business is the most powerful force on the planet for creating both economic prosperity, social mobility, and, and just opportunity. At the same time, even if you don't go into the private sector, to Ellis's point, the tool set and the, the capabilities that you're gonna develop, as well as the community that you're now part of, if you do go into the NGO, the nonprofit sector, which many people want to, if you do go into government, these are tools that are going to enable you to create innovation, to create value in those sectors as well. So if you think about the impact you want to have in the world, the MBA sets you up in a way that is quite unique in affording you both the capabilities and the opportunities to have that impact. 
And so to me, the value of the MBA in the short term and the long term is all about who you want to be and putting yourself on a path to have that impact in the world. So Scott, you're telling me that you're really running the moonshot factory. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's, I mean, business to me, one of the reasons I got into this coming from the private sector is I, I, I came to appreciate just how important business was in society, but how powerful education is to transform people's lives, to enable them to capture those opportunities. You put those together and what better place to work or go to school than a business school. All right, we've run out of time, um, but this has been sensational. I want to just tell everyone a little, a little story here. Uh, Peter may have graduated uh, in 1995, uh, but just to show you how well connected he is to the Ross Alumni Network and the school itself, uh, in August he is going on an unusual trip with the dean his wife has consented to allow him to leave to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. We are? <laughs> <laughs> Sharon didn't tell you? And you're going to do that with a group of students. We are. Uh, it's quite exciting. And uh, Peter has a lot of prep uh, in store for him. You know, I'm not good at hiking and I'm not good at camping, yes. so I got a lot of work to do. So actually, it's going to be as, as hard as it was prepping for the GMAT to get on that Stairmaster every day and, and master it, right? <laughs> anyway, to do. it's gonna be a great adventure for the two of you. I'm uh, a little bit jealous. And for all of you, really thank you for a terrific panel. So this is John Byrne with Poets and Quants at the MBA Summit at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. I hope you enjoyed our three panels. Uh, if you missed part of the presentation, uh, you'll be able to find it. We'll, we're going to do these very lovely videos of the entire morning's proceedings that will be available on our website for a long, long time. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for watching. Uh, I hope you were convinced that the MBA could be a moonshot for you. <laughs> That's right. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really.